Okay, welcome back. So I want to run through some one-way ANOVA examples here. All right, so let's say, so first we're going to kind of think about, all right, how do we really manipulate and work with this table? Then we'll look at a more uh, kind of realistic example. All right, but first we want, to, we want to work on manipulating our table. Okay, so say we had a situation where we've got six groups that we want to compare and ten total observations. All right, so you would want to know how to do something like this. If you were given this blank table except for two pieces, because we know that the sum of squares are, are kind of annoying to calculate by hand. All right, if you were given a blank table except for two of the sum of squares, you should be able to fill out the rest of the table for yourself. All right, so let's look over here in Excel. We've got our ANOVA table. Um, let's zoom in a little bit here. All right, so remember a couple things. My number of groups, or K in this example, was six. And my total number of observations, or N, was 10. All right, so for my group's degrees of freedom, that's simply going to be k minus 1 or 5. My error degrees of freedom, let's, let's do the total because that's the easiest thing to deal with. It's 10 minus 1 or 9. All right, my error degrees of freedom then is going to be this guy minus this guy. Now notice that's the same as just n minus k. All right, 4. Okay, so degrees of freedom, easy enough. A sum of squares would be complicated to calculate at this point, but we already have two out of the three pieces. So I know that groups plus error must be equal to total. So if I take total minus groups, right, that'll give me my error sum of squares. Your mean square, we take the sum of squares, divide by degrees of freedom. And do that for both, drag that down. Okay, my F test statistic. I take my mean squared groups, divide by mean squared error. So I get about, call it 16.87. Now how do I find that p value? All right, well, a couple different ways I could do that. So let's jump back over here and say you wanted to use the table. All right, a lot of different F tables are set up different ways, but generally, remember, we have numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. Our numerator is 5, our denominator is 4. All right, so I would be working in this cluster of, um, of F values. All right, well, my F test statistic of 16.87 would fall right there. It's pretty close to 15.52. All right, so it would fall right in between those. So using the table, I could estimate right, that my p-value is between these two numbers, probably a little bit closer to 0.1. All right, so if I were to estimate this p-value, I'd tell you, okay, it's between these two numbers, maybe even estimated at 0.01. All right, um, but we probably prefer you know, to get an exact p-value to do it in Excel. So I'm going to go f-dist, and when we're working with f-distribution, we're pretty much always going to be using the right tail. All right, so f dist right tailed. All right, f dist right tailed. I'm going to click in my test statistic here. Now, here's how I have to be careful. We have two degrees of freedom. The numerator degrees of freedom here is five. Denominator is four. Pop those in there. Um, remember, we estimated our p-value to be between 0.01 and something smaller. Pretty close to 0.01 though, and, and that agrees. And you could also, you have an F distribution graph in Minitab. Okay, if you wanted to do that, right, I can go to graph, probability distribution plot, view single. Right now, we want the F distribution. Numerator 5, denominator 4. Okay. So here's our F distribution. Bring this guy up, double click shaded area, x value, right tail, and I believe here it was what, 16.87. All right, so, okay, and it's telling me that area is very, very small. 
Okay, so we can find some of these numbers and manipulate this table on our own if we want to do that. But really, I mean, in practice, most of that we're just going to leave up to the computer, right? The computer will pop out an ANOVA table. It's good to know how it works, where they come from. But lots of times the computer is just going to pop that out for us, all right? So let's look at an example. And we've got some data here. We've got lab rats in three different groups. Um, with regards to how we're gonna we're gonna feed them for 40 days, right? Then they're weighing them. Okay, so here's kind of the breakdown of each of the three groups, right? They one group only has access to to chow, or I guess that's this you know traditional rat food. The other gets chow plus cafeteria food for an hour a day. The other gets their own chow plus cafeteria food as much as they want. All right, so we want to see, right? Does the does food access here have a significant effect on their weights? So let's think about how we would set this up. All right, so our hypotheses are going to be that all groups are equal. In other words, we could we could write it out like this. All right, our null is that the or our alternative is that the null does not work in this context that would mean at least one of these groups are different. All right, so we should technically check our assumptions. So, you know, I could make a I could make a box plot. I got to make sure that all the standard deviations look similar. All right, so here here's some summary statistics on my three different groups. So, my standard deviation here is about 50. It's about 50 there. This one's a little higher. Um, but remember our kind of rule of thumb is as long as we don't have the, the largest one twice as big as the, the smaller one, we're usually in good shape. All right, let's, we can check a box plot. We don't, we don't want outliers. Um, you know, we want all three of them to look at least somewhat symmetric. All right, so I think we're in pretty good shape here in meeting our assumptions. So let's bring the data over here into Minitab to really start making some calculations here. All right, so if I go here to Stat, ANOVA, One Way, it's our first option here. All right, we go to, um, we gotta, we gotta change up our thing here. So data in separate columns for each factor level and just bring in all of my columns. All right, for for what we're doing, you know, just the default option should be fine. So let's see what Minitab gives us here. All right, so it tells us our null means are equal, our alternative not equal, and it gives us here what we really want, our ANOVA table. All right, so it tells me I, I got a pretty large test statistic. All right, remember three groups, degrees of freedom two. Um, we must add 50 total observations there. Minitab does the calculations and finds a very small p-value. All right, so what does that mean? All right, I think we're gonna reject. And some of this other stuff, you know, can be useful. Right, checking the standard deviations is good. Um, this is essentially a. It's kind of like a box plot, but with confidence intervals around our mean. All right, so this this plot here that Minitab gives us is gonna be pretty useful. So here's the output we got. Really, ultimately, all we're interested in is the p-value, right? Because we reject. Okay, so what does that mean, right? There is differences in the mean. But just saying we reject or just saying there's a difference, right, isn't enough. So that's where some of the rest of our output comes in. All right, so let's look at some of our output. All right, so just the basic summary statistics, we could see... Right, we could see here, now this is a much larger standard deviation. Right? And we could see that this mean is, it, it looks at least upon examination to be lower than the other two. All right, well, when we make confidence intervals around those, and as I mentioned earlier, Minitab gives us a nice little graph of these confidence intervals. Okay, what you can tell is we're restricted and chow kind of overlap here. Extended and restricted overlap. All right, but the very bottom of my extended one does not overlap with chow. 
So just kind of visually looking at this, if our intervals overlap, we can't necessarily say that things are different. Now it's pretty obvious restricted and extended are not statistically significantly different. Okay, chow and extended I think are going to be different. Chow and restricted though it's not clear but I believe again that they do overlap. To check this, so so since we only have since we only have three groups, right? What are my possible comparisons? Well, I could compare one to two. I can compare one to three. I can compare two to three. So in order to compare two groups, we have the tools in place to do that, right? You can do a two sample t test. Okay. Now I don't think that I need to compare two to three. I don't need to compare restricted and extended. I mean, they're clearly overlapping on that graph, but. Um, Let's compare restricted to chow to see if they overlap. All right, running a two sample t, I get a big t test statistic. My p value is small. I think I'm going to reject there. We can check restricted and extended, but notice our p value we would fail to reject. All right, so I think where we can conclude here that chow is kind of the odd man out. All right, it's different from the other two. These two are the same, essentially. Okay, so it's not enough to just say we reject, right? We need to follow up and figure out, okay, why do we reject? Which groups are actually different than what we expected? So let's look at another example here. All right, now we have four groups, different ways of trying to treat brain tumor. All right, radiation, cannabinoids, combination of both, or just leaving it untreated. Okay, so hypotheses would be this, that they're all the same, or alternative is that one is different. So remember, we need to make an initial examination of the data. Um, and, and as far as meeting our assumptions, you know, let's just assume we have good sampling techniques. Let's look at the summary statistics. All right, so I think that what they're measuring is the size of brain tumors. All right, so we see some, some very clear patterns here. There's some very clear things. So irradiation actually appears to be the largest. Untreated, about the same size as your radiation, but a little bit smaller. Looks like untreated, we have a very large standard deviation. So what that's telling us is left untreated, right? It could potentially be small, could kind of go away, but you also have, have the potential for it to grow out of control left untreated. Okay, so untreated gives us our, our largest spread here. Um, but where's our smallest spread and our smallest mean? Irradiation plus cannab cannabinoids or cannabis, whatever it was. And we have a very small standard deviation there. Let's look at those in box plots. So if I were to look at these, I would almost say that irradiation and untreated kind of just look similar on a box plot. Cannabis looks like we have decent results there, All right, but when we combine those two treatments we have a very small spread and we have a very low mean. All right, that's good. We want a low mean in this case, right? The size of this tumor, we want it to be smaller. All right, but what about our assumptions? Well, my standard deviation here for this group is very, very small. Two times this would be, you know, four point something, whatever. This compared to 24, big, big difference there. All right, so technically we actually don't meet our assumptions. But just examining this visually and looking at the numbers, we may not even have to really run a test, right? I think there's almost fairly clear, clear results what the best course of uh, treatment is here. All right, so I hope, uh, hope you got something from these examples. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.